And we are continuing our series called What They Didn't Teach You in Sunday School. How many of you went to Sunday school growing up? You grew up in the church, went to Sunday school? AJ, did you go to Sunday school? I most definitely did. You did. I did as well. And uh, I thought we could share a few of our Sunday school experiences because, um, you know, it's, it's something that I feel like is, is good for us to maybe get off our chest. I think I've been dealing with this for a long time. I remember in Sunday school uh, growing up, um, I, I went, I was probably about second grade, Nate, and uh, so I was kind of uh, in class, and for some reason, the Sunday school teacher, uh, they uh, were doing bandanas, and they were passing out bandanas to everybody, and there was one black bandana, and of course, me, I was the shy one, very quiet, introverted, I kind of kept to myself, and so, and because my last name is Wittick, I'm all the way at the end of the alphabet, I got the black bandana. And I was so excited about it. Everybody hated me, glared at me. Well, then snack time rolled around. I left my bandana, got up, went to go get the snack. And wouldn't you believe it? Somebody stole my bandana. So I have a bad experience because I realized that there are thieves in the church and uh, there is no... There's nothing safe and sacred. And so for me, that, is, that has really scarred me for a while. How about you? I'm realizing that a lot of bad things happen at snack time in Sunday school because my, one of my main core memories about being in Sunday school as a kid um, happened at snack time. Um, it was a normal Sunday school. I was probably like, I don't know, six or seven years old. And I... Uh, we're looking at the felt board, and we're doing all the different things as their, the teacher's going through um, whatever story we were going through at the time. And I was so excited for it to be snack time, and she brings out the pretzel jar. You guys know those, like, thick, like, stick pretzels? They're real long, the ones that you used to pretend were a cigar. I know everybody did that. You all did. did. Yeah, everyone did that. <laughs> um, well, those were the pretzels, and I was so excited, and finally get handed one, and I'm, I'm so happy I have it in my hand. And I turned to look at my friend Ben. You remember his name. I definitely, I will never forget Ben's name because of what he did to me. Because I look at Ben with my pretzel in my hand, all excited, smiling. Ben is not smiling. <laughs> ben is looking straight ahead, dead sailoring at the wall. And he turns, and then he pukes all over my chest. <laughs> like, covers me. My sweater is just drenched. You were not smiling either. No. I dropped my pretzel. I didn't know what to do. I just, like, was stuck there. But that experience scarred me. I still don't wear sweaters because of that to this day. Yeah. I could understand. I could understand that. So, yeah, snack time, not a good time in Sunday school. But um, whether you had a Sunday school experience like that or not, this series is really just to, to talk about some of the things that weren't really ever talked about in Sunday school. And so I, <laughs> I just can't help but laugh at that. The series really is just designed to talk about these strange and obscure stories. And so if you're new to Awaken, maybe you missed a couple of weeks and you're like, why are there two people up there? Well, this idea is something that AJ and I had uh, years ago probably back in 2019, to talk about, make a podcast about strange things that are found in the Bible, and just talk about it and illuminate some truths to it. But the reality is the podcast never happened, and so what we did was we decided to turn it into a series, because the reality is there are just some stories in the Bible that we're reading, and we go, wait, what? Like, why is that story in there? Why is that detailed mention because the reality is all the stories that we're reading through and going through in this series, they're not ones that we like to put on a shirt. They're not bumper stickers. They're, they're not in picture frames on the walls of our houses. That's not what's happening at all. But I hope that as we're diving into these stories, as we're looking more into some of these truths, I hope what you're seeing is that there's even application to us thousands of years later. And uh, the strange story that we're looking at today is in Genesis chapter 9. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to the very first book, Genesis chapter 9. If you don't have a Bible and you have a smartphone, you can go to the Version Bible app. You can uh, look at the events tab under the more, and uh, you can follow along that way, or we'll have the verses up on the screen. But Genesis chapter 9, starting in verse 18, it says this, the sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. 
Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine, and he became drunk and laid uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both of their shoulders, walked backwards, and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they didn't see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years and he died. The title of today's message is called Naked Noah and the Grape Juice. That is... There's the message. But, but the reality is, when I was reading this passage this week, <clears throat> when I was looking at it, we all know the story of Noah. We're familiar with it. And we most associate Noah with the flood, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. But really, this is the last story that's talked about when it comes to Noah. And it's kind of a sad and tragic way for his story to end. And, and AJ, I don't know if, if you have anything to add with that. Yeah, when, when you think about Noah... You think of the traditional stuff, the boat, all the animals. You, you kind of, that's what comes to mind. But honestly, this is how his story comes to a close. And it's a very strange ending because I know for me, I actually don't even think I read this part of Noah's story until I was probably a late teenager at least. And it was a very long time until I saw this. And when you do read it, there's just questions about it. It's like, why is, what is the point of this being in here? Um, there's a lot of things that struck me um, personally. One of the things that jumped out at me is like, what's up with the walking backwards into the tent? Why do they do that? That seems like a one-man job at most. So, I mean, it doesn't take two people to hold a towel. Why do they both need to go in there? So that was one thing. Why are they, get, why are they walking in with, you know, holding one shoulder like this in there? What's the purpose of, behind that? Um, the way that um, Noah responds in cursing um, Canaan, Ultimately, that's um, Ham's grandson yeah. uh, cursing him. It just feels very like, why did he get so upset? I mean, it's not, it's not a great thing that he did, that he came in there and kind of barged in on him nude. That's not the <laughs> most thing. It's not what you want to see. Yeah. But at the yeah. same time, like, it seems like he's getting aggressively upset about it, and it probably shouldn't be that big of a deal. So those are just questions that jump out to me. Yeah, yeah, and, and so that's, that's good because we want to, that, that's part of when you're studying the Bible, you want to observe. You want to look at some of the very bizarre and strange aspects of the, of the story because once we kind of do that observation, we'll start to figure out, okay, let's, let's look and see what is really being told here. And so for me, when I was looking at this story, I'm like, it's interesting how it starts off because it almost kind of picks up after the flood in Genesis chapter 6. It's like, hey, the whole family kind of got off the boat and and then um, here's Noah. He's kind of uh, no longer a sailor anymore. He's now a farmer, and he takes his farming very seriously. And uh, in fact, he likes his product a little too much because he gets drunk and then naked in his tent and then passes out. And then it's kind of odd to me that here comes Ham just kind of strolling along and all of a sudden sees his father naked. And he's like, you know, my brothers have got to hear this. They got to hear how crazy dad is. And so he wants to go and tell some jokes. But it is interesting that Shem and Japheth, they take the more mature route, and they do. They kind of put this towel on their shoulders, and they just kind of walk backwards, face this way, and then just drop it. And I like to think they just bit, booked it right out of that tent. They're like, oh, we're done with this. But then even Noah, you know, he kind of wakes up, maybe feeling a little sick like Ben after Sunday school, you know, a little, little hungover maybe, a, a sick to his stomach. And he chews out ham, curses the grandson, and on the surface, we look at the story and we go, wow, Noah, you're like 600 years old. You should know a little bit better. Like, aren't you old enough, mature enough? You seem to be a little harsh. And, and it's like, you need to lighten up a little bit here. But 
what we're seeing is all throughout the series, though, there's a lot more happening. There's a lot more going on than what just meets the eye. And so uh, what we always like to do when we come to strange topics is we'll look at the characters, we'll look at the context, and we'll look at the language as well. But um, we'll look at the brothers or the sons here in just a few minutes because there's some that's mentioned about them. They're, they're mentioned later on in chapter 10. So we know some things, but for the purpose of, purposes of our story, uh, we'll look at it later on but, and, and look at the blessings and the cursings that are found um, in that. But, but I think it's important for us as we look at this story to look at the main character, and that is Noah. And, and the reason why I want us to look at Noah is because he kind of sets the foundation. We need to understand who Noah is because it'll help us as we work our way through the rest of this story. And so if you didn't know this, Noah's name means rest or comfort, which is ironic because Noah isn't associated with anything like that. I mean, think about it for just a second. When your name is most connected to the flooding of the earth, it doesn't seem to cry out rest or comfort, right? It seems a little chaotic. But Noah does have one of the greatest stories in all of the Bible. Noah was a man who found favor with God at a time when sin was very rampant on the earth. And in fact, it, the Bible tells us that God is looking and he's seeing how wicked things have become. And it tells us that God regretted making it. And that should tell us something today. That should really tell us just how bad things have got. For God to go, you know what? I wish I never created the world. I wish I never created mankind. And so God, basically what he's trying to do is he's trying to have a creation reset. And so God decides to send this flood to cleanse and reset the world. But what's interesting is that God finds favor with one man, and his name is Noah. And God says, hey, Noah, you're a righteous man. You, I have, you have favor in my eyes. Your family is righteous. So here's, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Basically, I'm going to flood the entire earth. But what I want you to do is I want you to grab your family, bring some animals, because I'm going to send a flood, and the, it's going to flood the whole earth, and it'll be up to you and your family to start over. A lot of pressure for a family. You're in, you're in charge of creation 2.0, basically. And so what we're seeing through Noah's life is that he is modeling a life of obedience. He does everything God commands him, commands him to do, even though it doesn't make sense. And so they spend almost a year in this ark. The flood waters recede. Noah and the family come off the boat, and it's not commanded. They don't do this. They do this on their own accord. They bow down. They worship God, and they thank him because, they, because God saved them. And then at the beginning of chapter 9, you can read it later, but then God makes a covenant with Noah and, and with the sons, promising, hey, I'm never going to flood the earth. I'm not going to do that again. In fact, as a way of reminding you of this promise of this covenant, I'm going to send a rainbow to kind of seal the deal. And then God makes another covenant with Abraham and with his sons, and it's kind of similar to that that we see at the beginning of Genesis, to be fruitful and multiply. And so God has told Noah that, and, and one other bonus thing that I think is great for Father's Day is that God has told Noah, hey, also now you can eat all of the animals. And so any father about to go have a steak, a burger, or something like that could say amen right there, right? We're thankful for that. But when you look at the life of Noah, I think we could think of a lot of words. We could think of him as a man of faith, an obedient man, a godly man. AJ, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. Yeah, I, I think when you think of Noah, there's a lot of different things that come to mind. Um, when I boil it down, um, he was definitely a man of faith and a man of righteousness. Um, that's actually what Hebrews 11 tells us. Hebrews 11:7 said that um, Noah was an heir of righteousness by faith. Um, so what that's telling us is that you can look at Noah's life and see that as a set example of what it looks like to honor God in a very hostile culture. Um, think about it in, in perspective. Um, you, you look at Noah in the time that he existed. This is a long time after Adam. Adam and Eve were there. They had their kids. Their kids had kids. A lot of people are on the earth now. And every single generation, people began to drift away from God further and further. They began to ser serve other gods all the way to the point where nobody even remembers the God that they're actually supposed to be following, the true God who's worthy of worship and honor. They've all forgotten them except for one guy, and that's Noah. That means that Noah would not have been very accepted in his time. People would look down on him. They didn't like the ways that he lived. They wanted him to assimilate and accept what they wanted to do, but he refused to do that, but instead to continue to live by faith 
live in righteousness and, and what God has asked him to do. And he began to um, see God respond to that because what Genesis 6, 8 said and what you already mentioned is it says Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Because again, Noah remembered God when everyone around him had forgotten God. And because of that, God gives him favor. God says, on the face of the earth, there is nothing but evil. Every single man, woman, child has nothing but evil in the center of his heart, is pursuing wrongdoing. And it said that God was sad that he had even created man. But then he saw Noah. And God gave favor to Noah because of the kind of guy that Noah was. He was that righteous, faithful guy. So that's what I think about when I think about yeah, Noah. Yeah, yeah. So let's, let's kind of start to look into the, the strange part of the story. And, and what's interesting, and I would, I would encourage you to do this later on your own, but as this week as I was studying and looking at the story, it is interesting to me just how many similarities there are between Adam and Noah. I don't know if you picked up on it as well, yeah. but it is really interesting just how um, when God created the earth with Adam and Eve, and then, of course, we see the transition later. And one interesting, this could just be bonus content for everybody, but one thing that I read this week was that Adam and Eve and Noah, they all sinned in this area of food. Adam and Eve took the forbidden fruit. Noah takes the wine. He gets drunk. And it's interesting to me that the very things God gives us to bless us became a curse. And so that's just some bonus content for you. I I really found a lot of similarities. It was hard for me to kind of not want to dive deeper into some of those parallels that we see with Adam and Eve and Noah, but I would encourage you to do that. But the strange part of this story starts in verse 20, and I want us to read it again. It says, Noah began, or yeah, Noah began to be a man of the soil and planted a vineyard. And and if you know anything about Noah, that's what his father did. So it's like he's going back into the family business. In verse 21, it says, he drank of the wine and became drunk and laid uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both of their shoulders, walked backwards, and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backwards, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So when we read this story, it's easy for us with our modern mindsets and our culture, where we live, where it's cool or it's fashionable to have every body part exposed. We see it in TV and movies. We could become very numb with our modern culture mindset. We could kind of read this and, get, and not get this. We could go, well, what's the big deal? He saw his father naked. So what? It's gross. It's kind of disgusting. You might want to gouge your eyes out for a minute, you know. You might try to go, man, I wish I had one of those... Um, uh, uh, oh, the, the alien movie with Will Smith. What is, there it is. Yep. Yep. Men in black. They just kind of, you know, and it's like, you kind of just erase the memory, right? Like that's what you kind of wish that they had. And so we read this and we go, what's the big deal? Why is Noah making such a big deal of this when it comes to his father? It's gross, but what's the big deal? Well, there's a couple of reasons for it. One uh, is because of the phrase in verse 21. Talking about Noah, it says that he lay uncovered in his tent. Oftentimes people look at that phrase and they associate it with sexual relations or even sexual acts or a castration happened, which is not what I believe happened. And AJ will talk about that here in just a minute, but I don't think that happened. But the the second reason why Noah's making such a big deal of this is because of the phrase in verse 22. Speaking of Ham, it says that he went and he told his other brothers what was going on inside. When you look at that word, told with delight, is what the Hebrew says. And so what we can know from that is basically that Ham is making fun of Noah. He sees what has happened to his father, and he starts gossiping about it to everybody there. you got to think, this is probably a hundred or so years after he started planting the vineyard. So there's a lot of people. It's not just the, the, the father and the three sons. There's a lot of people here. And so here's Ham. He's going around making fun, gossiping. He's probably like, hey, guys, you know what? I just found out about dad. Dude got drunk, stripped down, and is now passed out in his tent. Now, the story doesn't exactly say what happened, so we don't really know. But what we do know is that Ham humiliated his father. He dishonored his father, and he wanted other people, his brothers, to join in on that humiliation. Yeah, the whole thing is very complicated, And it's very hard to know exactly when you interpret it and you look into the original language exactly what was going on. But for me personally, as I studied this, as I read a whole lot of different things about it, I don't personally think 
that what we see here, what Ham did, I don't think that it had anything to do with um, sexual acts. I don't think it had to do with the castration thing. Um, I, I understand where people get those um, kind of thoughts from, um, but if you r look deeper into the wording, and this is kind of what I wanted to share, um, I don't really believe that the real wording of this in the original language points to that. So here's my reasoning behind why I believe that. Um, first of all, typically in, in this time period, um, there was an ancient euphemism, um, which was like, like terminology that was alluding to something that wasn't good. And the, the euphemism was, um, you shall not uncover the nakedness of whoever. And that term meant to like do something sexual. Um, it doesn't actually say that Ham did any kind of uncovering. It says that Noah uncovered himself. So that would imply that there's a little bit of difference going on here. It's not Ham doing that to him. Noah already did it to himself. Noah drank. He got naked. He's laying in his tent nude, discussing all the same. Not a good decision. Not a good thing to do. But it's not what some people may think that it is. Um, on top of that, um, it goes a little further when it talks about what Ham did do. Um, it makes some very clear lines. Um, it says that he saw the nakedness of his father. Um, the word saw does mean to see, means to perceive, means to like witness. So he visualized what was going on with his dad. But then it says that he saw that nakedness. And then the problem comes in because like what Nate said, he went and then told his brothers about it. And that word told is a little bit deeper um, than just like a quick joke. It's not just like a wisecrack. Um, it's to like declare or proclaim. So like Nate said, it's not just the three of them there. It's like a lot of people probably, their whole entire families. There's a lot of sisters there that aren't mentioned. There's a lot of, a lot of people. And when uh, Ham goes out and speaks, he's sharing all of this with everybody in a very boisterous, loud way. And the reason this is such a big deal is because that was like a massive breach of family ethic. Now, this is not modern day. Okay, we're talking about thousands and thousands of years ago. They did things very, very differently back then. The way the family structure operated, the way that people viewed um, the structure of a family was completely different. So you have to understand that as we're reading this, what's you know, really going on under the, under the surface. Because for Ham to do what he did, um, that would be like a disgrace on his dad. And what he's doing in talking about him and sharing this is shaming him partly, but also what he's doing is trying to assume in, in himself, he's trying to assume that he is greater than his dad. Now, this is a society that the patriarch or the, the dad is the leader of all of them. Everybody kind of submits to him and his authority. So in Ham doing what he's doing, yeah. it's like Ham is saying, dad's a loser. Dad doesn't deserve to be followed. Let's talk bad about him. Let's tarnish and, and trash his legacy. He's worthless. The gods that he follows, the things that he stood for, why would we follow that? He's a waste. Let's go our own way. We know better than him. That's really what's going on and what Ham is doing. That's why it's such a big deal. Um, that's why um, Ham's actions are, are so um, impactful in what happens later. Yeah, and I, th I think that's, that's really the big takeaway is, is, yeah, we could debate on what really did happen, but really what we're seeing here is that Ham is just trying to take the leadership of the family. He's finding fault with the father, and he's like, Dad can't handle this. I can. Everybody follow me. But what's interesting is that's contrasted with the brothers who did it the right way. Instead of adding shame and disgrace, they gave grace to their father. And, and AJ, I know you've got, you got some thoughts when it comes to that too. Yeah, right here, it's, it's fairly quick, but Shem and Japheth, the other two brothers, um, they have an, a choice to make when Ham comes out and starts talking to them. They can either participate and go down the same path and say, yep, Father's, he's out. We're ditching him now. We're taking over. We're, we're kicking him to the curb. We're going to do it our way. He's, he's not worth following anymore. Or they can make the choice of, no, we're going to actively choose to honor and respect our father, continue to put him on the, the level of authority that he has been on, 
and we're going to honor him by covering him. So that's, that is what they wind up doing. Um, so when they walk in backwards, the reason they do that together is because they both want to be associated as being united in the decision to honor their dad. So it's not just one. It's both of them saying, okay, we're both going to have a role to play. And there, it, for them, it says very specifically that they did not see the nakedness of their father. So that's, again, showing us the parallel between what Ham did and the difference between the brothers. Ham saw, but the, the other brothers did not. And they walk in backwards, drop that towel or whatever it was on their dad to cover him up. And when they do that, um, they could have mocked. They could have joked. They could have, you know, tore apart Noah's legacy, said that he's a waste. But they didn't do that. They chose to be men of faith like their father instead. Um, if you were reading this a thousand years ago, you would have read this and you would have thought, oh, wow, these guys are like displaying some like really honorable behavior. Like the way that they're treating their dad is, is excellent. That's, that's really, really good what they did. So that's the way that we should interpret it too. Like they are being very um, extra um, careful to make sure that their dad is, is respected in, in what they did. Yeah, yeah. So skipping along, we're going to look at verse 25. And, and it's interesting because I want us to pay attention to the curse because that's, I think, the other important part, the curse and the blessing that's given there. And, and the curse in verse 25, I think what's interesting to note is it doesn't say, thus saith the Lord, right? And there's the curse. And it doesn't say, thus saith the Lord, and there's the blessing. Um, what's interesting with the curse is I believe what's happening is that Noah curses Canaan. And, and a lot of us, we can look at this, we go, whoa, that seems like an overreaction, like wrong place, wrong time. Like, what did the grandson do? But this is what I believe is happening. Noah is prophesying that his grandson is already cursed. I believe what we're reading here is that Noah's like, hey, guess what, Ham? You're a wicked and evil son. And here's the reality. Your son, Canaan, he is cursed because he's just like you. He's wicked and he's evil. I like to, even in my mind, I like to even think that there's Ham and, and Japheth, or uh, uh, Ham and Canaan just kind of leaning against the wall, kind of laughing and smirking. They might even look the same. And I think Noah looks at him and he's just like, he's just like you. Noah saw in the future, saw what Ham had done, and he knew the symptoms were of a deeper rebellion against God, against the family, and against morality. He knew that the tendency would get worse and worse. And so what he did was he did a prophetic curse against Ham, or against Canaan, rather. And, and I don't know what you've, you've got on the curse. Yeah, more or less the curse part and the blessing part is pretty important to understand. Um, a lot of scholars actually believe, based on, the again, the original language, the way that it's structured, that there very well could have been like a 20 to 30-year gap between when Ham saw his father naked and everything happened and this prophecy happening. Um, and the reason people think that is because what um, Noah is doing in sharing this blessing and cursing um, mirrors a lot of deathbed prophecies. Um, so a lot of parents, and even if you look, another example of this would be in Genesis chapter 49 when Jacob blesses um, and speaks to the 12 sons that he had. He's about to die and he distributes a blessing and a cursing on some of these sons and kind of prophetically speaks of their futures, what they're going to do. And he's doing that based on he knows their tendencies, their character, the way they live. And he's looking at that. And also the Lord is kind of at work in that as well. I think you're seeing a similar thing here. I think Noah probably was on his deathbed. He's probably there. That's probably why Canaan's getting brought into it, because Canaan was probably there. And I think that Ham and Canaan are like what you said, they're very similar. Ham's taught his son to be just like him, to be disrespectful, to continue to reject and go away from the gods of his father and, and, fo and following the one true God. He's kind of going off on his own. And I think that what you see in that is uh, when he is cursed, what Noah says is um, that Canaan is to be a servant of servants or a slave of slaves. He's saying, you do not deserve to prosper because of the direction that you've chosen. Saying the, the way that you are going, Canaan, that Canaan is going, that Ham is going, you are deserving of failure because you've rejected all the things that we have held to be valuable and true. So that's kind of what's going on there. And it's interesting when you look at Ham's descendants, so Canaan, um, as he grow, um, grows and, and his family, you know, 
continues to settle and go different places. Um, they grow into the Canaanites. Um, other descendants of Ham would be the Egyptians. Other descendants would be um, the Amalekites, the Ninevites. Those are just some of the very famous ones. These are all very pagan people. They practice horrible violence, crazy sexual immorality. So what Noah says here in cursing them is, you are on a path of destruction. You do not deserve to prosper. And that's exactly what happens. If you look at all those people groups, that's what they do. In pursuing what they do, they fail. So Ham, ultimately trying to gain authority, actually ruins his life and future generations by ditching what his father had taught him. So that's the cursing side of it. Um, the blessing side of it is interesting. Um, Japheth, um, he's basically said, hey, may Japheth dwell in the tents of Shem for the rest of his life. That's a prophecy of peace. Say, let him be at peace with his brothers. And Japheth would go out, um, and his, his descendants would um, land on, like, the coast of the Mediterranean, and then they would spread into Europe and Asia. And they would actually become very prosperous, which is what Noah wanted. He said, let you be prosperous and wealthy. That's kind of his, his heart behind the blessing. And then it's very interesting because for Shem, it's kind of the shortest one, but it's the most important. He says, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. The reason that's interesting to me is because the only one of the brothers that God is connected to is Shem. God, Noah doesn't associate God with Japheth, doesn't associate him with Ham. He's very clear to point out that of all the three brothers, Shem, there's something different about him. He must have some kind of connection and desire to pursue the same God that he's pursued because um, the Lord that he mentions, that's, that's God's actual name, Yahweh. So he says, adored or admired be the name of Yahweh, who is the God of Shem. So that's really important, which like what you said, later on in life, um, Abraham would come from Shem's lineage. All of the people of Israel would come through that. Ultimately, Jesus Christ would come through that lineage. So all the people of the world are blessed through Shem's line. That's really cool. Yeah. No, I think it, it does. It is really cool. And then even what's cool with Japheth is that a lot of people believe he was the, the Gentile descendants. And so in a way, that prophesying of the blessing comes true because then um, – uh, first, it tells us in the Bible that God was for the Jew first and then for the Gentiles. And so we even see that prophecy come through that when Noah's like, hey, I want somehow Japheth and Shem's lines to come together, that actually does happen um, through Jesus. But yeah. um, So what are we supposed to do with this? How are we supposed to apply it now that we understand the characters, now that we understand the context, some of the language of, of what's going on? What are we supposed to do with this story? And with this being Father's Day, I thought it would be appropriate if I just spoke to the fathers for just just a minute on how this story can apply to us. Because the reality is, like we talked about earlier, Noah was a righteous man, but he was living in a time like ours. And I think it's easy for us to read this and hear that he's a righteous man and go, yeah, that's easy for him. It's a lot harder for me. But the reality is he was surrounded by evil and we are also surrounded by evil. But Noah did what was right. He led his family well. He was faithful to God. He obeyed God. He listened to God. He spent time with his family. He showed his boys about hard work. He showed what faith looked like when he built the ark. Noah did all of the right things. And even though he was still a righteous man, we see at the very end here of his story, he still struggled with sin. He got drunk. He got naked. He passed out. He, he disgraced himself, disgraced the family. He failed as a father. And I think this is a very important lesson for us who are fathers here today. Even though he was a righteous man, we see that Noah still struggled with sin. And so here's the challenge for the dads here. We need to do our best to lead our family like Noah did. To lead them, to build them up in faith, spend time with them. We need to spend time with God. We need to model what that looks like. We need to follow God the best that we can. We need to set for our kids an example of what it looks like to be a man who follows Jesus. But here's the other important part of this lesson. When you do mess up, because you will mess up, you may even mess up in the parking lot. You may mess up when you're having your um, uh, dad's Father's Day uh, lunch, dinner, whatever it is. You're going to mess up. But when you do, show your kids what repentance looks like. Show them what forgiveness looks like. Show them what it means to, to love and give grace, even when they dishonor you, like Ham did to his father. 
show love, show grace, show mercy. Yeah, I'm not a dad, I'm not a father, and I kind of approach this from a different angle. I'm from the angle of a son, and kind of how I view this being a child of, of two parents and, and how I view my own family. And kind of the, the application for me that I drew from this is that um, keeping it kind of as concise as possible, imperfect people can still speak the truth. Now, I know when I first say that, for a lot of us, we're like, yeah, AJ, that's like so obviously. We're all sinful. We're all works in progress. God's working with us. And I know that we know that, but for whatever reason, when it comes to our parents, we seem to throw all that out the window. Because we view our parents and we see the mistakes that they make, the hypocrisy that they walk out sometimes. We view those things, and we, instead of having grace for them, we say, not worth it. They don't know anything. I'm not going to follow them. Why would I do what they do? They're a failure. I'm not going to do that stuff. I'm going to go make my own path. And I think it's really interesting um, because what we wind up doing is we use their bad choices to discredit the lessons and the examples that they've tried to set for us. And we use that to justify our own decisions and our own direction and abandoning what they taught us. Now, that's interesting because ultimately what we're doing in, in making those decisions is we're propping ourselves up as better and smarter um, because of seeing those mistakes. We're saying, I know better, so I'm going to do my own thing, which is exactly what Ham did. It's the same exact sin, the same exact problem. And the thing that I learned in all of this is just that truth is truth regardless of the mouth that it came out of. You know, truth is, is something definable. Um, if something is genuinely authentic truth, it doesn't matter actually where it came from. It's still a value, and we still have to live it out and take it into account. No matter whether the mouth it came out of is very corrupt and completely off the path or not. Now, that's important for us to understand. Noah was this righteous man who lived by faith, and then he made a really poor decision. He made a bad choice, messed up, and his son Ham, like what we just said, he used that choice to assume a dominant view of himself over his father and what his father believed. And in doing that, he discounted his father's righteousness. He discounted his father's faith. He discounted um, the example that his dad had set. And by doing that, like I talked about earlier, he ultimately set himself up for a path of disaster. And he set his future generations on a path of disaster. So what we learn is how no, no matter where the truth is coming from, we need to take that to heart and accept that, no, that still has value, even though the mouth it's coming out of might not be perfect in and of itself. It's interesting. Um, you view the other brothers, Shem and Japheth. You see them, and they took a different approach than Ham. They saw that their dad wasn't perfect, but they chose to cover him up, to put the, that blanket over him. And that wasn't just because of respect that led them to do that. It wasn't just because they had this, like, fear of their dad. I believe it was because they had, like, a genuine, authentic love for their dad. In fact, it reminded me of what's in 1 Peter um, verse, chapter 4, verse 8. It says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. They were willing to cover their dad's sin. Now, when parents fail, it tempts us to question, do they really know what they're talking about? When we're kids and we're growing up and our, our parents fail, they, they do things that are hypocritical. We see that. We perceive it. And for a lot of us, we say, well, why am I going to believe that? Why am I going to follow that? And that's because parents are supposed to build foundations for their kids. They're supposed to pour into them the values that they're going to stand on later in the future. Now, when you see that as a child growing up and your foundation that's been built by your parents, and then you see them completely fall apart or go the opposite way of what they've been pouring into you, it shakes up your whole world. That's a normal response. That's not odd. That's not strange. It shakes you up because you feel like, is it all fake? Is it not real? And I think that for a lot of us, we've probably had that. I know for myself personally, um, my family has gone through some bad things in the past that caused my whole faith to be shaken. And my faith that had been essentially established by my parents, that foundation, was shooken up completely. And I was wondering, am I going to abandon this? Is this even worth following? 
But I eventually had to realize, well, I need to not live on just my parents' faith anymore. I need to follow my faith for myself between me and God. Is this real? This is either true or it isn't. So I chose to follow. And in doing that, um, I started to live a little bit differently. And at that time, that significantly challenged me. But I learned that bad choices shouldn't discredit the good choices. The bad choices that my parents have made. That shouldn't discredit the good choices that they did make. To pour into me the good values. To pour into me a good foundation. I shouldn't discredit those things based on the bad. Now, we don't pretend that the bad didn't happen. We don't pretend like we just move on and ignore it and act like it was never there. All that we do is we make sure that we don't allow it to create bitterness inside of us towards our parents. And I think it's important, I just want to be very clear with all of you guys, I'm not saying that all parents have set a great example. I think that's important to know. I'm not saying that every parent has done all kinds of things great. I know that for a lot of you who might be here today, you maybe grew up in a household where you didn't have a, a parent that cared or set an example of righteousness or set an example of what it looks like to honor God or a foundation of faith. You may not have had that. And I want you guys to know, even if you didn't have that, that it, for you it may never have been an option to discredit the good because of the bad because the good was never there. I want you to just remember this. Don't allow your lack of a role model to discredit a good God. Um, that's the temptation often is to discredit a good God based off the experience that you had. Don't, don't allow that to happen. Um, you may not have seen righteousness lived out. You may not have had good choices role modeled for you. Um, but that doesn't mean that those things aren't out there. It doesn't mean that truth still isn't important. That the truth that is out there should be lived, that there's great deep value to it. Um, these things are modeled every day by our Heavenly Father as we read His Word. So if you didn't have that example, I want to encourage you, read about your Heavenly Father because He is perfectly good in every single way. And if you dig into that, you can have that role model that you didn't have. So I want to encourage you in that. And I want to just kind of remind you guys, even for myself, when I look at the life that I have now, even though my world was shaken up a little bit, um, in the past because of decisions that had been made in my family. Um, I look at my life now, and I realize, because I'm not going to discredit those things, I realize that much of the decisions, the faith that I stand in today, hinges on those good things that my parents taught me, even though they weren't perfect. And I recognize and I value so much, I'm so thankful for what my parents have taught me, even though they're not perfect, even though they made mistakes. I can look back and I can say, no, I still value, the, value what they did. I still love them, and my love for them covers over a multitude of sins because I see that good that they had for me, and I still want them to, to know that, hey, you did well um, despite all of these other things that may have happened. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the big takeaway. Um, whether you're a father, whether you're a child, whether you're a believer here today, I think it is that, that passage in, in 1 Peter 4 that says, love covers a multitude of sin. And uh, I would even say what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 6, that love doesn't keep records of wrongs. We don't have our little black books where we write down, all the things they did. What we do is we, we don't condone sin. We don't even, like, excuse it. We confront it when necessary. But we don't go around acting like a fool, like Ham, and spreading it all. We act like the two brothers that gives grace and dignity and love to the person. Amen?